At the beginning of Bosch's electronics history, experts recognized the great potential of automotive electronics. Many functions in the car could be made more reliable and maintenance-free. At the same time, semiconductor technology was emerging. Semiconductors make robust automotive electronics possible. Bosch seized the opportunity, even though its entry into this market was not without risks. Fifty years ago, the first semiconductors were developed here in Reutlingen, at that time only for our own applications. Over time, this has grown more and more, and about 25 years ago, in addition to integrated circuits, we also started with sensors. If the integrated circuits for cars, we call them ASICs, are the brains of a unit, the sensors are the eyes and ears, the hands, the feeling. The problem at that time was that well-established electronics companies, like Philips and Telefunken, were already working on these new technologies. But it was almost impossible to get the engineers from these companies to leave their jobs and join us. And there was no literature on automotive electronics either. So we studied patent specifications and had to gradually and painstakingly put the components together. Our first automotive IC was used for the regulator. The second was the flashy unit. That was a real step forward in that we simply learned by experimenting. I think it's an extraordinary achievement that the Bosch management managed to stick to their guns. The first electronic components proved very successful, and it was therefore logical for Bosch to become involved with electronic controls. One pioneer at the time was Hermann Scholl, who later became chairman of the Bosch Board of Management. As a young engineer, Hermann Scholl developed the electronically controlled gasoline injection system, known as Jetronic. Jetronic allowed a significant reduction of emissions and gasoline consumption in internal combustion engines. The Jetronic was therefore a milestone in Bosch's automotive electronics history. By 1976, the oil crisis was over. Bosch had recovered from sales declines and high investments were possible once again. This was when we started developing a new technology for electronic control units, the so-called hybrids in the Reutlingen plant. The reason why hybrid technology was initiated in the first place, and Mr. Scholl was quite involved in this, was the fact that printed circuit board technology was not very reliable. Electronics had a very bad reputation and showed up repeatedly in failure statistics. Hybrid technology was able to mitigate many of the problems. That was a breakthrough, and it convinced others that hybrid technology in cars was a good technology. The customer wants quality. And quality simply means it works. It always works. I joined Bosch in 1972. At the job interview, I was told that I'd be responsible for digitizing the engine electronics. This turned out to be an immense task a microcomputer or processor in the middle, a suitably sized memory device on the side, connected via bus, and on the other side, the I.O. circuit, to handle all the traffic to the environment. By now, I had gained an understanding for what kind of technology I wanted or needed to make it work in the engine bay. I discovered CMOS to be the best technical solution. However, at the time, CMOS was frowned upon in the semiconductor industry because it was considered expensive. People were skeptical, but its success proved me right. 
The car had already been rethought to some extent during the transition from the analog world to the digital world. Not only in terms of the hardware architecture and the range of possibilities, also the methods of development were completely different. Suddenly we had to start writing software. We had a new level of freedom, a chance to design in completely new ways. It was a cultural change and a change in terms of the skills required. But it was successful and Bosch became the leading automotive supplier in the field of electronics. Micromechanics, or MEMS, i.e. Micro-Electro-Mechanical Systems, is a technology that allows us to produce mechanical structures on silicon, which is the substrate that is the basis for all microelectronics, and to connect them with the electronics on a component. Microelectronics need sensory organs in order to perceive the environment. Micromechanics allow us to create these sensory organs these sensors for microelectronic systems and to manufacture them in very small sizes. The technology available at that time was a wet etching process using potash lye, which had a lot of limitations. That was not ideal. It was limited both in geometry and in size. You could only do what the silicon allowed. We knew this would be the best process technology for us if we could increase performance by 10 to 100 times with plasma etching technology, which was well known from semiconductors. The electronics manufacturing people in Reutlingen said it had significant business potential and it soon went into series production. Series production started in 1997. Our best case expectations were 6 million units per year and today we're talking about billions per year. MEM sensor technology for consumer electronics evolved from the automotive sector. At first they said we need it for an electronic stability program to detect when the car is moving in a way that it shouldn't. We need a trigger for airbags, acceleration and pressure sensors. But if MEMS can be used for cars, some experts asked why not offer the technology for the consumer electronics market as well. Sometimes I walk around town and I see people using wearables or smartphones and I think they contain the sensor that I worked on. That's a special feeling. There are smartphones that have an accelerometer inside, a gyroscope, a pressure sensor and a magnetic sensor that we developed. In the 1970s, the oil crisis and energy shortages were a driver for R&D. Then it was environmental protection and emissions reduction. And finally, all these concerns came together. Energy consumption, the environment, scarcity of resources. That's why we continued to research internal combustion engine technology, because there was still a lot to be done there. At the same time, we pushed ahead with electrification, battery management and everything in that field. Measuring, controlling and regulating energy converters is our core strength at Bosch. Whether the energy converter is an internal combustion engine, a gasoline engine, a diesel engine, an electric vehicle drive with battery, or a fuel cell with hydrogen and battery, the basic principles of measuring, controlling and regulating energy converters is the same. Here in Reutlingen, we manufacture the so-called ASIC, which provides the intelligence to the power module. We also produce the silicon carbide semiconductor that manages the currents and we manufacture the inverter, in other words, the entire control unit. The semiconductor is the muscle, and the ASIC is the brain. Our advantage is to combine the two, pursuing our target of function integration and miniaturization. The uncertainty involved in producing a new semiconductor technology with the associated quality risks is enormous. It's important to have colleagues on your side who agree that a new post-silicon technology is needed. We were lucky to have people in the plant who were on board with this idea. Our newly established base, silicon carbide, is a highly stable semiconductor that can handle high currents and high voltages. These are needed in electric and hybrid vehicles, for example, but are also used in the renewable energy sector. Solar technology is a major customer, as are wind turbines and rail drives, wherever electricity and electrical power need to be switched or processed in high energy density. 
geschaltet werden muss oder weiterverarbeitet werden muss. In den nächsten Jahren in the next few years, the number of semiconductors in vehicles will triple and we need the capacities to meet this demand. In order to drive our innovation further and to support the transformation of our company, which will require a far greater supply of ASICs and MEM sensors, we have to take this step. With the 300 mm wafer factory in Dresden, we will make the largest single investment Bosch has seen in its history. The biggest single investment to date was the 200 mm wafer production, and before that it was the 150 mm wafer production, both here in Reutlingen. This is very investment intensive, but it also brings major competitive advantages for Bosch. Future technologies are manufactured both in Dresden and in Reutlingen. Components from Reutlingen are brought together with components from Dresden, assembled and tested at a site in Suzhou, and delivered to a customer in China, for example. That is our network. The investment in Dresden therefore enables our company to undergo this transformation. If you look back at the history of automotive electronics at Bosch, you can learn a lot from it. Recognizing opportunities, daring to do new things, not being discouraged by setbacks and learning from them. These patterns are part of Bosch's DNA, part of our entrepreneurial success and they will remain so in the future as Bosch transforms itself more strongly into a software company and an AIoT company that develops artificial intelligence in the Internet of Things. There too, these characteristics will be of crucial importance. Bosch's success story should encourage us to push ahead with new technologies, to take risks as we did when Bosch first entered automotive electronics.